1. Purity and Preservation For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because, when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul clearly identified Christianity's degeneration, 1 Timothy 3 verses 1 to 5. Its effectiveness would decline in direct proportion to people's receiving the word of God as the word of men. According to the above passage, the word of God no longer effectually works in those who consider the Bible to be simply the word of men. Unfortunately, this group now includes most graduates of seminaries who attended school to learn the Bible but finished fully convinced the Bible is no longer self-sufficient. The Bible contains several promises concerning the actual words of God, but none seems any greater than the one found in Psalm 12. Pure Words Preserved God pledges the supernatural preservation of His words. The passage in Psalm 12 begins by describing the words of the Lord as pure words. According to Webster's Dictionary, for these words to indeed be pure, they must be free from moral defilement and without spot. KJB Psalm 12 verse 6 The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Verse 6 reveals the extent of the purity of God's word, likening it to that of purified silver. Nevertheless, many so-called Bible scholars refuse to accept the purity of the words of God. If people choose to disbelieve God's promises, he will not force himself upon them, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 38. Instead, he has promised to show himself pure only to those who are pure, Psalm 18 verses 25 to 26. God attaches his solemn promise to these pure words. He promises to providentially keep and preserve his pure words from this generation forever. KJB Psalm 12 verse 7 Thou shalt keep them, the pure words of the preceding verse, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them, the pure words of the preceding verse, from this generation forever. God promises to keep and preserve his very WRDS. This promise includes generations living in 20th and 21st centuries. As the centuries have elapsed, God has not somehow become impotent to preserve his word just because man has turned his back on God and become a God unto himself. These important truths concerning God's word and his promise to preserve his words are removed to varying extents in every modern translation. This study primarily focuses on the most widely marketed modern version, the New International Version, NIV. As a means of introduction, compare what the King James Bible, KJB, says concerning God's promise of providential preservation to the corresponding words found in the New International Version, NIV. Psalm 12 verse 6 and the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. According to the NIV, the words of the Lord are no longer pure. What does the Bible say about purity? Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Titus 1 verse 15 Instead, the NIV says the words of God are simply flawless. Furthermore, the NIV makes no reference to God's solemn promise to preserve his words generationally. Note also that the NIV changes the entire context of the passage in the next verse. Neve. Psalm 12 verse 7 O Lord, you will keep us safe and protect us from such people forever. Although the change in context is easily identified, read the verses together to be sure you do not miss this extraordinary alteration. Neve. Psalm 12 verse 6 And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. 7 O Lord, you will keep us safe and protect us from such people forever. The NIV changes the very context of this passage from the words of the Lord in verse 6 to people in verse 7. The reviser's objective is easy to recognize. The Christian cannot be allowed to know God's promise to preserve his word for every generation. Otherwise, the entire premise of man's supposed need for their newer and better revisions would lack justification. If these contemporary translations were to reveal God's promise to preserve his words, would these truths impact the lucrative Bible market? If Christians could know from reading a modern version that God promised to preserve his word, they could recognize their individual responsibility to find the pure, preserved word of God today. The NASV 
Recent inquiries concerning the changes in the new American Standard Version, NASV, have prompted the author to address the NASV in this opening chapter and again in Chapter 13. These two discussions of the NASV are alone sufficient to establish the translation as just another corrupt modern version. Most of the corrupted NIV passages used for comparison throughout this book are also corrupted in the NASV. In fact, in many cases, the NASV perverts the truth even further. NASV Psalm 12 verse 6 The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. Seven you, O Lord, will keep them, you will preserve him from this generation. Read that again. You will keep them? You will preserve him? The NASV makes even less sense than the NIV. Take note that the 1995 updated NASV changes the pronouns in verse 7 from you to thou. An interesting adjustment to say the least. Live by every word of God. Not only did God promise to provide every generation with his word, he also instructed man to live by every word of God. Man cannot live by every word if the Lord has failed to preserve every one of his words for us. Does God command and demand the impossible? KJB Luke 4 verse 4 And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. God promises to preserve his word for every generation and commands man to live by every word of God. Once again, the modern version revisers seem unwilling to allow the child of God to know or believe these simple truths. Otherwise, the primary rationale for the existence of these versions would be null and void. Neve. Luke 4 verse 4 Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. According to the NIV, the Lord Jesus Christ did not say that man is to live by every word of God. Does God require this or doesn't he? Did the Lord say this or didn't he? One can imagine that Satan hated to hear these words leveled against him during the first century AD as he tempted the Lord. Even at that time, he probably began plotting how he would one day rip the words right out of the Lord's mouth in his word. According to the Bible, Satan's scribes were busy even before the completion of the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17. Now, the Bible revisers of the 20th century have simply picked up where these corruptors of old left off. What about the NASV? NASV. Luke 4 verse 4 And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The updated NASV, previously mentioned, includes the phrase about living by every word of God, after having omitted it for the previous 35 years, 1960 to 1995. Consistency is certainly not one of the hallmarks of these modern versions. Greek Textual Variations Since God promised to preserve his word, where is it today? One book truly stands alone, and all the other versions find it necessary to compare their particular version with that one book the King James Bible. Why do they all seem to be in collusion against this one book? Has someone convinced them that they must try to dethrone the king before they have any chance to succeed with their respective revisions? Every modern version originates from, or is significantly influenced by, a set of manuscripts different from the texts from which the King James Bible primarily originated. For example, the New Testament of the KJB comes primarily from the Textus Receptus, received text, whereas the modern versions emanate from the corrupt Westcott and Hort Greek text and the equally corrupt Nestle's Greek text. Pure fruit from corrupt roots? When the root is corrupt, so is the fruit. Pure fruit can come only from a pure tree, Matthew 7 verses 15 to 20. That is the way God made his word, and that is the way he preserved it. However, Satan has always had his garden variety fruit tree, Genesis 3 verses 4 to 5. The Bible gives clear warning concerning the necessity of determining the type of tree from which a fruit originates, Matthew 7 verse 20. In the following chapters, this book compares the fruit produced by the Textus Receptus-derived King James Bible with the fruits of the modern versions. Each of these modern versions is significantly influenced by the Westcott and hort nestle united Bible Society texts. The primary purpose of this book is not to explore the manuscript evidence in order to keep things simple. Although one chapter delves into this area, many fine works exist which provide sufficient evidence for the accuracy of our King James Bible. 
See bibliography for a list of such works. Surely, a reasonable person will agree that there is something sinister about any book claiming to be a Bible that attacks the virgin birth, the blood atonement, salvation by grace, and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of the modern versions do just these things and many more. Thankfully, as we shall see, the King James Bible preserves, protects, and presents these sacred truths, as well as all other truths God intended for us. Incorruptible Word God describes His Word with such penetrating terminology. For example, the following passage states that a person is born again by the incorruptible Word of God. Therefore, by definition, the true Word of God is not corruptible. KJB 1 Peter 1 verse 23 Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. No matter the opinion of the so-called Bible scholars, God does not lie. His word is not corruptible. The modern translations cannot allow anyone to know this truth. Their basis for updating God's word would be destroyed if they kept these simple truths intact. Nevertheless, beginning in the first century, Satan has made repeated attempts to alter the New Testament and has spent far longer corrupting the old. Of course, Satan uses man as the pawn. The Apostle Paul makes this point in the following verse. For we are not as many, which corrupt the word of God. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17 Once corruption enters the text it is no longer collectively God's word. Paul even warns of counterfeit letters circulating, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 2. So much for the claim of the oldest manuscripts being the best simply based upon their age. Even in the first century, scribes were intentionally influencing others by inserting their own beliefs into copies of the manuscripts. Who do you think it is who does not want man to know that God's true word is incorruptible? Neve. 1 Peter 1 verse 23 For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. It can be certain that the NIV translators do not think this truth important. No longer is one taught the truth concerning God's promise to preserve his incorruptible word. The NIV merely says it is imperishable, as does its predecessor the NASV. NASV. 1 Peter 1 verse 23 For you have been born again not of seed which is perishable but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. The self-proclaimed scholars of today seem to have no problem with these alterations. James White is a prime example of a Bible scholar who believes that the oldest manuscripts are the best simply because of their supposed antiquity. He states, most scholars today, in opposition to the KJV only advocates, would see the Alexandrian text type as representing an earlier, and hence more accurate, form of text than the Byzantine text type, one of course, he has swallowed Satan's plan completely. All of the modern versions elevate the older, more reliable manuscripts from Alexandria, Egypt, over those used to produce the King James Bible. What are the promises of God concerning His Word? Six truths from the King James Bible concerning God's Word are as follows. 1. God promises that His Word will stand forever. Isaiah 40 verse 8 The grass withereth, the flower for death, but the word of our God shall stand forever. 2. God promises that his word can make you clean. John 15 verse 3 Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. 3. God promises blessings to those who hear and keep his word. Luke 11 verse 28 But he said, Ye rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God, and keep it. 4. God promises the blessings only to those who accept his word as authoritative. 1 Samuel 15 verse 23 For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. This application is not limited to an Old Testament king. It applies to the New Testament Christian as well. If a Christian avoids suffering persecution by rejecting God's word, that decision causes dire consequences, 2 Timothy 2 verse 12. 5. God promises that if we continue in his word, we will know. The truth and the truth will make us free. KJB. John 8 verse 31 then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. 32 And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Failing to compare this change would be tantamount to negligence. 
First of all, the NIV changes word to teachings, detracting from the authority of the entire word of God. This changes the emphasis from the author of the word to the teacher of the teaching. Neve. John 8 verse 31 to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. 32 Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The NIV further changes make you free to set you free. Make is more active than the passive word set. God's word doesn't just release us to freedom, it empowers us to experience true God-given freedom. When a person gives up his KJB, he gives up some of his freedom to be all God wants him and enables him to be. 6. God promises that he will judge us with the same word by which we are to live. John 12 verse 48 He that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. If you don't receive God's words, you have rejected him. What basis will God use to judge man and hold him accountable? The only justifiable basis is his holy, written word provided for man to follow. God magnifies his word above all else. Personality Trait an attack against the word of God is an attack against the very person of God. Proverbs clearly establishes and reveals the personality of the word of God. Proverbs 30 verse 5 Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. God personifies his word, relating it to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. John 1 colon 1, 114. God provides man with his pure word and expects man to live by it today. God has provided man with every word of God enabling man to fulfill God's will of living by every word of God. Matthew 4 verse 4 But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Bible does not say we are to live by every word that proceeded, past tense, out of the mouth of God. It uses the word proceedeth. The use of the present verb tense reveals that the word is alive, 1 Peter 1 verse 23. It is not that we are adding to God's word, but that it is adding to us. God's word, alive and magnified. The word of God is not something that stopped once the originals were penned. 2 Timothy conveys the same thought, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. God's word is the most powerful element in the universe. God says it is quick, powerful, sharp, piercing, and able to discern a person's thoughts and intentions. Oh, how powerful it is. Hebrews 4 verse 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Most self-proclaimed scholars agree that God gave man his perfect word in the originals. With the importance God places on his word, the conclusion that some have drawn makes no sense. Their actions imply that God allowed his word to be lost through the centuries. If his word has in fact disappeared, one must conclude that God has permitted his piercing, dividing, and discerning sword to be replaced with a sword lacking power to pierce or destroy the enemy. This sounds more like a butter knife. However, the Lord has magnified his word above even his own name. This would include the precious name of Jesus. Name here signifies his reputation and character. Psalm 138 verse 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. He has magnified his word above his name. Why would he do this? Think about it. A man's name is only as good as his word. If a man's word lacks integrity, his name and character are certainly tarnished. This holds true concerning the Creator. 2. God's name is only as good as his word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John 1 verse 1. Only a good name can display integrity and honor. Faith, the key element. God is powerful. His word is powerful. It is therefore logical that Satan would dedicate his most potent resources toward destroying a Christian's faith in the word of God. He is very busy working to accomplish this end. Satan knows that if he can destroy a person's faith in the word of God, he can make that word unprofitable in the individual's life. Read for yourself. Hebrews 4 verse 2 For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Has your faith been destroyed? If so, think back to when and how this destruction took place. 
Unfortunately, many preachers have lost their faith during their seminary training. In turn, many others sitting under the preaching of these seminary graduates lose theirs too. Do you remember how you lost yours? Regardless of the pathway taken, if your faith has been destroyed, Satan has gained his primary goal. God rebuked the Jews for their lack of faith, Deuteronomy 32 verse 20. We are told that the Old Testament examples are given to us to help us avoid repeating Israel's sins. They are given to us for examples and in samples, 1 Corinthians 10 verses 6 and 11. Many Christians are ignorant of God's word and its applications. This is especially true of those who have been busy perverting God's word, the modern version producers. Old Testament Guide The 23rd chapter of Jeremiah shows God's disgust with those responsible for the perversion of his word. When the prophets prophesied falsely, attributing their lies to the Almighty, the reader senses the Lord's anger and disgust. Finally, we see him rebuking the prophets for stealing his words from their neighbors. KJB Jeremiah 23 verse 30 Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words every one from his neighbor. How does someone steal God's words from another person? The context of the passage shows that they were passing off their own words as the very words of God. Modern version editors are likewise guilty of the same thing. Consider the NIV reading that again casts doubt upon whether the words were God's or simply supposedly from him. NIV Jeremiah 23 verse 30 Therefore, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from one another words supposedly from me. It seems reasonable for God to rebuke the prophets for stealing his words from their neighbors. However, the NIV says that God was upset because the prophets were stealing words that were supposedly from him. Does it seem logical that the Lord would be rebuking these prophets for stealing words that were not really his at all? One book stands alone is written for all those interested in re-establishing or further strengthening their faith in God's word. Simple verse-to-verse -verse comparisons allow you to easily see the pattern of corruption in the modern versions. Topical chapters in this book highlight the modern version's clear attacks on specific truths and doctrines of God. May your faith be strengthened, restored, or established in God's word. Pray that you will magnify his word and give it the prominence God expects and surely deserves. The next two chapters deal with the attack upon the doctrine of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Claiming deity for Jesus Christ simply means that Jesus Christ is God. Cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses claim that he is not God. Modern versions follow suit with their perversion of this most important of doctrines. One White, the King James Only Controversy, Op. Sit, page 43. 2. Deity Denied. For if the true New Testament text came from God, whence came the erroneous variant readings ultimately saved from the evil one, and how could the true text have been preserved save through the providence of God working through his church? 1 David Otis Fuller Modern version producers recognize the importance of convincing Christians of their desire to elevate the incarnate word, Jesus Christ. Yet, with seeming impunity, they unashamedly attack God's written word. According to the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't elevate the incarnate word unless you simultaneously elevate his written word. The Lord exposes the underlying problem as one of unbelief. John chapter 5 equates Christ's spoken words with the written word of God. John 5 verse 46 For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. 47 But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? According to the Lord, the written words of God are important. For decades now, the modern versions have been hitting the market at the rate of several per year. As a result, we now have hundreds of different versions of the Bible from which to choose. How did it all begin? To answer this question, we must revisit the early formative years of the modern debate around updating the Word of God. The first well-known modern version to appear on the market was the English Revised Version, ERV, of 1881 in Europe. It was supposed to be a revision of the KJB but became a new translation from the critical Greek text. The American Standard Version, ASV, followed the ERV. It was first published in America in 1901. Although the ASV copyright page claims to be a revision of the King James Bible, it is not. The ERV and the ASV are the great granddaddies of all modern translations. They initiated the majority of changes into English so common today. These versions also included study notes for the reader. One quickly ascertains the thoughts and intentions of the earliest revisers by examining the footnotes found in these early versions. 
The purpose claimed by the producers of these oldest of translations was to simply modernize the language and render these versions easier to read and understand. However, if modernizing the language of the King James Bible was their primary intention, why then does every modern version deviously attack the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus accepts worship. The American Standard Version died out long ago. It is no longer an acceptable version, having been replaced by the more than 200 more modern choices. For this reason, only a single verse from the ASV, along with its corresponding footnote, will be considered in the present study. First, the King James Bible, KJB, John 9 verse 38, and he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Amazingly, we have agreement between the two texts. The ASV says the exact same thing as the King James Bible. ASV, John 9 verse 38, and he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. In this case, the problem does not involve a change in the text itself. Instead, the attack manifests itself in the footnotes of the ASV. Both the KJB and the ASV reveal that the Lord Jesus Christ received worship. However, the footnote corresponding to this verse in the ASV blasphemes the Son of God. Here, in the great granddaddy of all modern versions, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ is vehemently and overtly attacked. By examining this footnote, one can quickly see that the revisers did not believe Jesus to be God. The ASV publishers footnote the verse referring to Jesus receiving worship. The ASV footnote reads, the Greek word denotes an act of reverence, whether paid to a creature, as here, or to the Creator. Two translators of the American Standard Version and the English Revised Version believed our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to be a created being. Sheer blasphemy. Since the Lord Jesus Christ was the one being worshipped in this passage, the translators reveal their disbelief concerning the fact that he is the creator of the universe. Such a flagrant attack on the deity of Christ should suffice to illustrate the point unbelievers produce the great granddaddy versions. See page 412 for actual photocopy of the footnoted and copyright pages. The Revised Standard Version, RSV, published in 1952 was another highly touted modern update. The copyright page of the RSV verifies that it is a revision of the English Revised Version of 1881 to 1885 and the American Standard Version of 1901. For this reason, we can address the RSV as an offspring of the American Standard Version. As proven by the ASV footnote, the translators of the American Standard Version producers equated the worship of Jesus as directed toward a created being. After publishing the ASV, later revisers realized their heresies were better concealed by tampering with the verses themselves rather than explicitly expressing their true beliefs in footnotes. The RSV changes which follow are a case in point. KJB Luke 24 verse 51 And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them, and carried up into heaven. 52 And they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Instead of casting doubt upon the Lord's deity through a footnote, the RSV simply deletes the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ received worship. The scripture teaches that only God is to receive worship, Matthew 4 verse 10, and we have already read the reviser's footnote revealing their rejection of Christ's deity, RSV. Luke 24 verse 51, while he blessed them, he parted from them. 52, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. The 1960 NASV follows its predecessor RSV by omitting worship. Interestingly, the updated 1995 NASV places worship back into the text after having omitted it from the text for 35 years. Jesus the Son of God Not only do the revisions attack the Lordship of Jesus Christ, but they also attack every other major attribute concerning his deity, including his virgin birth. Most Bible students recognize the prophecy contained in Isaiah chapter 7 to be critical to a true understanding of the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The KJB states that a virgin shall conceive, thus demonstrating a supernatural act resulting in the conception of the Son of God. This prophecy was fulfilled by the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. KJB Isaiah 7 verse 14 Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. The removal of virgin from Isaiah chapter 7 in the RSV directly attacks the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that Mary remained a virgin prior to the birth of Christ made the conception a supernatural act. 
RSV. Isaiah 7 verse 14 Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Satan knows that if the doctrine of the virgin birth is purged from Bibles, likewise the efficacy of the blood shed on Calvary's cross is polluted. The Bible says that God shed his own blood, Acts 20 verse 28, not the blood of a mere sinful man of Adam's race. Sometimes a new translation reveals too much too fast. This passage from the RSV is a case in point. Immediately upon discovery of this attack in the early 1950s, uproar against the RSV commenced. The blatant infidelity of the RSV eventually brought about its own demise. It is important to note why the change was so easily spotted. Most of the RSV readers were raised on a KJB. Although the attack from Isaiah chapter 7 was well publicized, another more subtle attack on the virgin birth was less apparent. KJB Luke 1 verse 34 then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? When a woman says, I know not a man, she is a virgin. But does a woman without a husband necessarily imply virginity? RSV Luke 1 verse 34 And Mary said to the angel, How shall this be, since I have no husband? Obviously, these two verses do not convey the same meaning. One proves the virgin birth, KJB, and the other leaves room for doubt, RSV. A woman who states that she does not have a husband proves nothing concerning her virginity. There are many more examples from the RSV that attack the virgin birth, but these two should suffice. Therefore, we will turn our attention to the most popular modern version, the New International Version, NIV. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the virgin-born Son of God, the Bible repeatedly points out that Joseph is not Jesus' father. Only the King James Bible remains true to God's purpose and plan. It clearly distinguishes between Joseph and the mother of the Lord, preserving a distinction of paternity. Mary is called his mother, but Joseph is not to be addressed as his father. KJB Luke 2 verse 43 And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. The peculiar wording of Joseph and his mother is sure to stand out as rather odd-sounding to the reader. God wants his word to be especially unique, giving a distinct sound, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 7. The NIV removes this distinction and changes its impact by replacing the distinctive wording with his parents. Neve. Luke 2 verse 43 After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. It is not necessarily incorrect to say that Joseph and Mary were the parents of the Lord. Luke 2 verse 41 However, it is wrong when God desires to point out that Joseph's relationship to the Lord differs from Mary's relationship to him. Again, KJB Luke 2 verse 33 And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Satan is never satisfied with an indirect attack on truth. He will always seek to further dilute the truth turning it into a lie. However, when he does so, it is much easier to identify his handiwork. No matter how one feels about the preceding verse from the NIV, the attack grows even stronger and more direct as we continue the comparison. The next verse directly attacks the Lord's deity by destroying the doctrine of the virgin birth. See for yourself as the NIV refers to Joseph as Jesus' father. Neve. Luke 2 verse 33 The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Joseph was not the father of the virgin-born son of God. However, he was the father of all of Mary's other children, Matthew 13 verse 55. The King James Bible only refers to Joseph as the father of the Lord one time. This happens as Mary rebukes her son for staying behind in the temple conversing with the religious leaders. Mary says, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. How does her son, the son of God, respond? Her words were misguided and the Lord corrects her as follows, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Luke 2 verses 48 to 49 God the Son corrected his earthly mother when she inaccurately stated that Joseph was Jesus' father. God never leaves truths like these open to mere chance. He settles the matter and holds each person responsible for how he handles these precious truths. Any Bible that addresses Joseph as the father of the Lord Jesus Christ, uncontested, is a deceptive counterfeit, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17. The Lord thought the distinction important enough to correct his own mother. 
One can imagine what will happen to these Bible revisers when they stand before him in the day of judgment. Jesus the Creator The Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Jesus is God. Therefore, their own version of the Bible, called the New World Translation, NWT, wholly serves their purposes. It claims to be rendered from the original languages by the New World Bible Translation Committee with a revision date of 1961 CE. Even the use of CE in the copyright date is a blatant attack on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Use of the CE signifies an unwillingness to use Adiano Domini, translated in the year of our Lord. CE stands for common era, representing nothing, but certainly used to deny the Lord's deity. An important point to consider is that the Christ rejecting NWT originated from the same set of manuscripts as the other modern translations now marketed. Granted, the NWT blatantly attacks Christ, but the foundational association still exists. KJB John 1 verse 1 In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God. This example reveals the depths of the modern version perversion. The NWT and the Jehovah's Witness doctrine directly attacks the Lord Jesus Christ by claiming that he was merely a God. NWT John 1 verse 1 In the beginning the word was, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. The New World Translation need not be concerned with how it portrays the Lord Jesus Christ since it has a captive audience, 2 Timothy 2 verse 26. This audience is the cult known as the Jehovah's Witnesses. Nevertheless, we can learn much by considering that they chose to use the same corrupt manuscripts as the other versions. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus was a created God, rather than having eternally existed with the Father and Holy Ghost. However, God's Word states that the Lord Jesus Christ was not created, but was instead the Creator of all things. Colossians chapter 1 states this truth superbly. KJB Colossians 1 verse 16 For by him, by the Son mentioned in verse 13, were all things created, that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, or dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him, and for him, 17 and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Since the Jehovah's Witness doctrine demeans the Lord Jesus Christ, one should not be surprised by this next change. Notice how the NWT repetitively adds one word, other, changing the whole meaning of the passage. In doing so, the NWT directly attacks the person and character of our Lord and Creator. NWT Colossians 1 verse 16 Because by means of him all other things were created in the heavens and upon the earth, the things visible and the things invisible, no matter whether they are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities. All other things have been created through him and for him. 17 Also, he is before all other things, and by means of him all other things were made to exist. This passage states that the Lord created all other things. What is this designed to imply? This change means that Jesus created everything, except himself. It means he was created by God, but God used him to create all things other than himself. Sheer blasphemy. The foreword to the NWT, copyright 1961, states, The translators who have a fear and love of the divine author of the Holy Scriptures feel especially a responsibility toward him to transmit his thoughts and declarations as accurately as possible. Translators of the Word of God are to transmit his words, not simply his thoughts. However, this same translation philosophy underlies all of the modern versions, such as the NIV, which purport to follow the dynamic equivalency theory. The foreword continues. They also feel a responsibility toward the searching readers of the modern translation who depend upon the inspired word of the Most High God for their everlasting salvation. It was with such a sense of solemn responsibility that the Committee of Dedicated Men have produced the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. The writers of the NWT realize that people will trust in the NWT for their everlasting salvation. Unfortunately, trusting the NWT for salvation is basing your salvation upon a structure built on sinking sand. Matthew 7 verse 26 Can you imagine knowing that others would stake their souls and spiritual growth on something you produced, which missed the mark so badly? People are trusting in it for their salvation, just as people are trusting in the other modern versions for theirs. They miss the mark, too. Can a person get saved by reading Romans 10 verse 13 in the NWT? It reads, For everyone who calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved. 
This reading attempts to point a person away from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by not mentioning that one must call upon the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, to be saved. Is any further proof required for one to declare this translation a deceptive work of Satan? The NWT openly attacks Jesus in these and many other verses. The most recently developed versions do, too, but much more subtly, Genesis 3 verse 1, making the newer versions even more dangerous than their heretical counterparts. Hundreds of additional verses from the NWT could be used to further illustrate this heresy, but why waste the space and time? Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Matthew 7 verse 20. Keep in mind that the majority of the verses pointed out as changed by the NIV are likewise changed in the NWT. Usually, when the modern versions, such as the NIV, NASV, Living Bible, ESV, etc., differ from the KJB, they align themselves more closely with the Christ-rejecting Bible of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Get a copy of the NWT and compare the changes yourself. The NIV and NWT align in concert against the KJB, Amos 3 verse 3. The following example reveals the NIV's association with the NWT. The NIV attacks Jesus as the Creator, too. The Bible says the Father did not create anything by Himself. The Father created all things by the Son. Yet, in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says and God said, Consequently, Jesus must be the person of the Godhead who spoke everything into existence in the beginning. Ephesians provides another great proof text for the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ reflecting that he is the creator. KJB Ephesians 3 verse 9 And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Once again, the modern versions alter a passage in the KJB so that it no longer proves the Lord Jesus Christ to be the Creator. This attack is reminiscent of the assault found in the Great Granddaddy Version, the ASV, like Father, like Son. The Bible foretells the result of the blind leading the blind they both fall into the ditch, Matthew 15 verse 14. Neve. Ephesians 3 verse 9 And to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. According to the NIV, the Lord Jesus Christ is not the Creator. Something that destroys such an important doctrine aligning itself with the most perverted of versions needs further examination. Jesus Manifest in the Flesh One book stands alone in claiming without controversy that God was manifest in the flesh. When something is without controversy it is not controversial and remains indisputable. At least, when you read it in the King James Bible, God took upon himself the form of a man, therefore, he was manifest in the flesh. Jesus claimed to be that man, and the Bible says that he is that man. That makes Jesus God, right? This is the end of controversy when one reads the clear testimony of the King James Bible. KJB 1 Timothy 3 verse 16 And without controversy great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Believing the King James Bible, there can be no doubt who was manifest in the flesh. It was God. However, the New International Version attacks the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ in very subtle ways. The indisputable truth proclaimed by the KJB cannot be found in the same passage of the New International Version. The Bible plainly states it was God who was manifest. The NIV no longer makes this truth evident, but replaces God with he. Neve. 1 Timothy 3 verse 16 Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. The NIV fails to prove that Jesus is God. To say, he appeared in a body, means nothing. Everyone has appeared in a body. When the KJB states, God was manifest in the flesh, a critical statement is made and a crucial truth conveyed. The NIV is not even grammatically correct. He is a pronoun that refers to a noun or antecedent. There is no antecedent in the context. Therefore, this verse cannot be used as a proof text for the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. As the ancient landmarks are removed, Proverbs 22 verse 28, is it any wonder the world stands confused? Jesus from everlasting. Now we come to a particularly overt attack on the Lord's deity. 
The Old Testament book of Micah prophesies of the coming Messiah from Bethlehem, Matthew 2 verse 1. The verse plainly says that the ruler in Israel one day is to be the Lord who is from everlasting. KJB. Micah 5 verse 2 But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Undeniably, the one from everlasting has no beginning, otherwise he could not be from everlasting. The Lord Jesus Christ is from everlasting, and therefore no beginning can be attributed to him. The blasphemous NIV instead alleges that Jesus had an origin. Thus, the NIV creates doubt about the Lord's eternal preexistence before taking upon himself the form of man. That is blasphemous. The Jesus of the Bible has no beginning, he has no origin, unless you believe the NIV is right and Bible is wrong. Neve. Micah 5 verse 2 But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. The NIV claims that the Lord Jesus Christ had a starting point. If he has an origin, or a beginning, he is not God. One should not fail to grasp this truth. God has no beginning. If Jesus has origins then he is a God, just as the Jehovah's Witnesses claim, God the Son was present in Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning. This same heresy was also very evident in the Revised Standard Version of 1952, which includes the same falsehood in the book of Hebrews, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified have all one origin. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Hebrews 2 verse 11, the Lord has no origin, regardless of how many of the modern perversions agree together against the testimony of God's one book. If the motive of the new versions is simply to update the language, then why do they pervert the truth and in fact, destroy it? The Lord Jesus Christ has no beginning and will have no end. Otherwise, he would not be God and the savior of the world. The Bible refers to the Lord Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son, John 1.18, 3.16, and 3.18, thus emphasizing the distinction between Christ, the begotten Son, and believers, who are sons by the new birth, 1 John 3 verses 1-2. The New American Standard Version, following the lead of the corrupt Vaticanus and Sinaiticus Greek manuscripts, have God the Father creating, begetting, another, lesser God in John 1 verse 18. However, Acts chapter 13 in the King James Bible clearly refers to the begotten Son. KJB. Acts 13 verse 33 God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. When the father said this to his son, it was not at his birth. It was at his resurrection. He became the first begotten of the dead. Revelation 1 verse 5. God did not become the Lord's father when he was born of Mary or at his resurrection. Both father and son are from everlasting, with no beginning. The son always was, but not so in the NIV. NIV. Acts 13 verse 33 He has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have become your father. The Lord Jesus Christ did not become the son of God at any time during his earthly life or ministry, Psalm 2 verse 12. The Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, can be found throughout the Old Testament. Numerous appearances are revealed prior to his being born of Mary. A great passage and proof of this truth is located in the book of Daniel when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the fiery furnace. Notice who else shows up the eternal Son of God. KJB. Daniel 3 verse 25 he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. For the Son of God to show up in the fiery furnace, he must have existed prior to his becoming a man in Matthew chapter 1. The king recognized the fourth figure in the furnace for who he was and who he is the Son of God. Can this be proven using an NIV which makes the change to a son of the gods? Neve. Daniel 3 verse 25 he said, Look. I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. The NIV fails to reveal the identity of the fourth person in the furnace as the son of God. 
The NIV aligns itself with the Christ rejecting Jehovah's Witness Bible by refusing to identify the Lord Jesus Christ as God. Considering that sons of God can have a negative connotation, as reflected in Genesis 6 verse 2 and Job 1 verse 6, the error is compounded. The Apostle Paul tells us of the second Adam, showing that he is the Lord from heaven, present tense. KJB 1 Corinthians 15 verse 47 The first man is of the earth, earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. The second man refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. He had no beginnings, no origin. He is the Lord from heaven. This is another proof of his deity, at least in a King James Bible. Neve 1 Corinthians 15 verse 47 The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. No longer is he the Lord from heaven. No longer can one use these very clear testimonies of the Lord's deity in the perverted New International Version or any other modern perversion. They don't say the same thing. Jesus, without sin. The NIV stoops so low as to attack the sinlessness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Most Bible students are aware that the Lord became angry when he saw the hypocrisy of his fellow Jewish brethren. The Lord's anger is illustrated in the following passage where the hypocritical Pharisees are watching to see if he will heal on the Sabbath day. KJB Mark 3 verse 5 And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. In this case, the New International Version agrees with the King James Bible. Both verify that the Lord got angry. Neve. Mark 3 verse 5 He looked around at them in anger and, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Although a man's anger is frequently sinful, it is blasphemous to claim that the Lord sinned as he became angry. The King James Bible protects the sinlessness of our Lord by explaining that one can be angry with his brethren without sinning so long as there is a cause, or reason, for this anger. Anger, however, cannot be justified without a cause or reason. KJB Matthew 5 verse 22 But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. No true child of God would ever claim that the anger of the Lord was unjustified. He certainly had cause. However, the NIV removes that important phrase, without a cause, and makes a blanket condemnation of anyone who becomes angry for any reason. According to the NIV, anyone that becomes angry with his brother is a sinner, including our Lord. NIV Matthew 5 verse 22 But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. This verse in the NIV makes the Lord Jesus Christ a sinner. It says anyone who is angry will be subject to judgment. Verses such as these infuriate true Bible believers. Is there not a cause for our anger? 1 Samuel 17 verse 29 David knew there was a cause when Goliath was reproaching Israel and his God. Bible believers know there is a cause when man attacks God's word. Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Ephesians 4 verse 26. However, always speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4 verse 15. God laid down his life. 1 John contains another passage that undeniably proves the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. In this text, the pronoun he refers to the antecedent God. KJB. 1 John 3 verse 16 Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. The pronoun refers to God's laying down his own life for us, again proving Christ's deity. Read the NIV and sense the hostility against the truth. Unlike the KJB, this verse in the modern versions cannot be used to prove the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. NIV. 1 John 3 verse 16 This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Yes, Jesus Christ did lay down his life. However, the modern versions destroy a primary purpose of the passage. It no longer serves as a proof text for Christ's deity. The passage is meant to convey that it was God, after taking upon himself the form of mortal man, who died for our sins. Thus, Jesus Christ is God, Jesus the morning star. Now that the modern version's attack on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ has been clearly established, our attention turns toward the source of this attack. Satan is identified as Lucifer only one time in the Word of God. 
Before we look at the passage in the book of Isaiah, which identifies Lucifer, reveals his past, and foretells his future, we must first establish who Lucifer is not. For this reason, we must take note of the identity of the morning star. KJB. Revelation 22 verse 16 I Jesus have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. The Bible and the modern versions both state that Jesus is the bright and morning star. Having established the identity of the morning star, our attention focuses on Isaiah chapter 14 the only place in the Bible that mentions Lucifer by name. He is the son of the morning that was created perfect until pride destroyed him. Notice the five times that he uses the personal pronoun I. KJB. Isaiah 14 verse 12 How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? 13 For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, in the sides of the north. 14 I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. 15 Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. One day Lucifer will be cast down to hell. The KJB proclaims this truth in the singular biography and identification of Lucifer. However, this is not the case in the blasphemous NIV. Instead of being brought low, the NIV allows Lucifer to become the imposter he desires so much to be, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4. Instead of revealing Satan, the archenemy of God and man, the finger points in the Savior's direction as though he is the imposter. Remember who the book of the Revelation identified as the morning star, now, look at the one to whom the NIV blasphemously points its finger Jesus Christ. Neve. Isaiah 14 verse 12 How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn, you have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. 13 You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. 14. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds, I will make myself like the Most High. 15. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. The NIV fails to reveal Lucifer, but instead attributes the history and future of Lucifer to the Morning Star. According to Revelation 22 verse 16, the morning star is the Lord Jesus Christ not Lucifer. Thus, the NIV indicates that the Lord, rather than Satan, actually sinned. This passage in the KJB is the only place Lucifer shows up by name. He remains masked in the NIV. Displacing the Lord has always been Satan's ultimate objective. All of this deception has been in preparation for the day when the Antichrist will overtly claim to be God. The Bible foretells this future event, so that he is God. Sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4 The NIV and the ESV's day star makes that deception all the more possible. The Antichrist will claim that the Lord Jesus Christ was the false Messiah and that he is the true one. Can you imagine how much easier the deception will be when he picks up one of these modern versions to substantiate his claim to be God? In James White's book Attacking the King James Bible, Mr. White answers these legitimate concerns with the following, The person under discussion in Isaiah 14 is obviously not the Lord Jesus Christ, and how anyone could confuse the person who is obviously under the wrath of God in that passage, note verse 15, with the Lord Jesus is hard to imagine. 3. My concerns for misunderstanding here and elsewhere are not motivated by self-preservation. I know to whom the passage refers because my King James Bible tells me it is Lucifer. However, lost people are being progressively exposed to the modern versions in lieu of the KJB. The Bible says Satan will come with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10 the Isaiah passage from the modern versions may be a key tool used by him to deceive many people, Mark 13 verses 5 to 6. The Bible says many impostors will come in the name of Christ, Luke 21 verse 8, claiming that he never came in the flesh, 2 John 7. We can expect that they will point to the Lord Jesus Christ, the morning star or day star, as the true deceiver, Matthew 27 verse 63. Deception will increase dramatically in the last days, 2 Timothy 3 verse 13. Defending these changes while understanding their implications is complete biblical infidelity. Imagine the dire consequences during the tribulation as people are taught from the NIV that believers should be marked. 
See Ephesians 1 verse 13 discussion in chapter 4. According to the NIV, believers are marked. Future consequences of such false teachings are more disturbing than can be conveyed within the pages of this book, Revelation 13 verse 16. Following the rapture, modern versions will continue displacing the KJB at an ever more alarming rate. Those left behind will be convinced by these modern perversions that God's people truly do take the mark, so why resist it? The Bible battle pits the Bible believer against the father of lies, John 8 verse 44. On whose side do you find yourself? Jesus in the Old Testament. Many of the changes revealed thus far have exposed some of the direct attacks on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. One book stands alone, clearly revealing Christ's deity found in the Old Testament. A favorite Old Testament picture of the Savior occurs in the story of Abraham and Isaac. When Isaac asks about the lamb sacrifice, Abraham reveals the future sacrifice of the Lamb of God. The Bible does not simply say God will provide a lamb. It implies that he will provide himself as the lamb. KJB Genesis 22 verse 8 And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. The Bible says that God will provide himself a lamb. Recall that a ram was caught in the thicket, Genesis 22 verse 13. God provided a ram at that time indicating that verse 8 contained a prophetic design. This seemingly insignificant detail actually adds further significance to Abraham's comment concerning the future coming of the lamb, John 1 verse 29. The modern versions completely destroyed this poignant picture, along with many others. Neve, Genesis 22 verse 8 Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Yes, God will provide a lamb, but the greater truth is revealed when one realizes that Abraham was prophesying of the day when the Lord would provide himself as the sacrifice for our sins. What picture does your version convey? Jesus the judge. The Lord Jesus Christ is not only the creator of the universe, but will also be the judge of the same. However, only God can judge on the last day. Thus, the following passage further proves the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians will stand at his judgment seat. KJB Romans 14 verse 10 But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. All Christians will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Each of us will have his work judged to determine the eternal reward received. Clearly, the one who died for us the Lord Jesus Christ will be our judge. Not so clear in the NIV, as it fails to refer specifically to the judgment seat of Christ. Neve, Romans 14 verse 10 You, then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Not only is the deity diminished, the NIV actually contradicts the truth. The Father has assigned all judgment to the Son. The NIV passage contradicts this truth as presented in the NIV and the KJB in John 5 verse 22. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Jesus Omnipresent When the Lord Jesus Christ was talking to Nicodemus, he gave proof of his deity and oneness with the Father. According to the following verse, while the Lord was physically on earth, he was in heaven as well. We may not fully understand these truths because of our finite comprehension, but the truth remains. Jesus was in heaven while he was walking on the earth. KJB John 3 verse 13 And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. The evidence continues to mount. Verse after verse shows the attack on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The truth is easy to see when one compares the modern versions to the standard, Jeremiah 50 verse 2. Unfortunately, there is no opportunity for comparison when a person uses only the modern versions. The problems can only be recognized upon comparison. Only a person that has read and memorized the King James Bible can recognize the existence or magnitude of these changes. No omnipresence here. Neve, John 3 verse 13 No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven the Son of Man. In the NIV, this verse no longer reveals that the Lord was walking on earth while simultaneously residing in heaven. He is one with the Father. His hearers must have thought him crazy or heretical. The Jews understood the implications of such a statement. 
Look at their reaction when the Lord Jesus Christ proclaimed, I and my Father are one. 31 Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. John 10 verses 30 to 31 Jesus the Resurrection Next, we consider the attack on the resurrection of the Lord. The Lord told his hearers that, shortly, they would no longer see him because he was going to the Father. The souls of all Old Testament saints following death were sent to paradise in the heart of the earth. But the eternal, sinless Son of God was resurrected from the dead, Mark 9 verses 9 to 10, and went to the Father. KJB John 16 verse 16 A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Satan vehemently hates the resurrection. When he finds an opportune time to impair its clear teaching, he opens his penknife and does his dastardly deed, Jeremiah 36 verse 23. No mention of the resurrection is made in the following verse from the NIV. The NIV sounds more like a magician's disappearing act. Neve. John 16 verse 16 In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. The NIV snatches the resurrection from another verse. Jesus foretold his death many times, John 12 verse 33. The KJB points out that he would be going to the Father, who is in heaven. This statement foretells his resurrection and the fact that his body would not remain in the grave, nor would his soul remain in the heart of the earth. Jesus equal with God. As we have seen, the King James Bible clearly declares the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ time and again. If Christ was not, in fact, God manifest in the flesh as he claimed to be, he was a mere deceiver. If his claims of equality with the Father were false, everything he said could be questioned. However, he knew he was not robbing God of any glory by claiming equality. KJB Philippians 2 verse 6 Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The NIV again subtly denies the deity of our Lord and Savior by stating that equality with God was not something to be grasped. Grasped by whom? By man or Jesus himself? Neve. Philippians 2 verse 6 Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Confused? Not by God's true word. All of these truths about the Lord Jesus Christ must eventually disappear in order for Satan to complete his deception, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, and impersonation. Some would have us believe we should simply accept these fallacies, since the truth can be found elsewhere in most of the modern versions. Not so. We must recognize these warning signs as satanic attacks on something that is holy and pure. The modern versions apparently have a motive other than simply revising the language of the Bible. From the preceding examples, it is clear that they instead shape and support an agenda to dethrone Jesus Christ as my Lord and my God. John 20 verse 28 Man continues to modernize the Bible, yet the King James Bible remains enthroned. A typical justification for the existence of the modern versions is their supposed readability. The underlying premise is that our understanding of the modern languages has evolved into something superior to those living in 1611 and that we have older and better manuscripts now available. These false presumptions are dealt with in later chapters, but why do we have so many different versions? The preface to the New American Standard, a version fallen upon hard times decades ago, gives great insight as to why so many have been produced. None of them withstands the test of time. The ASV was heralded as a replacement for the KJB when it was published in 1901. 23 years later it went broke and sold its copyright to the National Council of Churches. According to the preface of the New American Standard, the Lockman Foundation realized that the ASV had fallen into disuse. Quoting from the preface of the NASV, the producers of this translation were imbued with the conviction that interest in the American Standard Version should be renewed and increased. Perhaps the most weighty impetus for this undertaking can be attributed to a disturbing awareness that the ASV of 1901 was fast disappearing from the scene point four. Another of the modern version producers had a conviction, dollar, that interest in their copyrighted text, dollar, should be renewed and increased, dollar. They grew disturbed that their version was disappearing from the scene, i.e. the lucrative Bible market dollar. Even James White has admitted that money is the driving force behind the plethora of modern versions, 1 Timothy 6 verse 10, and he was employed by the Lockman Foundation. Here is the typical position of the modern-day Bible critic as expressed in a book published in 1999. 
The first paragraph refers to a quote from a century earlier before the Bible version debate had fully heated. The next two paragraphs update their position and reveal the infidelity involved in preaching from a book one does not believe. Do not needlessly amend our authorized version. It is faulty in many places, but still it is a grand work taking it for all in all, and it is unwise to be making every old lady distress the only Bible she can get at, or what is more likely mistrust you for falling out with her cherished treasure. Correct where correction must be for truth's sake but never for the vainglorious display of your critical ability. Not one word of God's word has been lost to us. And in the cases where we may not be sure which variant most accurately repeats the original wording, not one doctrine is affected. Not one truth is compromised. But the fact is, most of us trying to preach Christ are doing so out of the King James Version. We love and honor it, Z. What is the point? Twofold, even some great preachers from a century earlier did not understand the issue, and it is easy to justify preaching from a book that you do not believe if your audience does not know what you truly believe. The modern critic teaches that there is no significant difference between the underlying Greek texts, no significant differences between the resultant Bible versions and, I suppose, no issue to discuss. The fact that they are using a Bible that they do not believe matters not to them. Jesus is God once and for all. After preaching a message on the deity of Jesus Christ, someone once asked me if I knew of the changes to Revelation 1 verse 6 affecting my subject. This change not only detracts from the deity of Jesus Christ, but also attacks the doctrine of the Godhead existing in three persons, Colossians 2 verse 9. The Bible says that Christ made us kings and priests when he washed us from our sins in his own blood, verse 5. Now verse 6. KJB. Revelation 1 verse 6 and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Because Christ made us all priests, this has become known as the priesthood of the believer, negating the need for a separate class of priests like that which existed under the Old Testament economy. Christ as our high priest offered the final blood sacrifice now we are to present ourselves as living sacrifices to him, Romans 12 verses 1 to 2. The modern version change is very simple. They move the personal pronoun as making a plurality of gods or eliminating the Son as God altogether. Now the reading becomes his God. Neve. Revelation 1 verse 6 and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Christ now has a God referred to as his God. If Christ had a God then what was he? you would either have to take the position of the Jehovah's Witnesses or the unbeliever. Unbelievers do not believe that God has ever existed in three persons and the Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Christ was a lesser God and a created being. Some would point to Christ's question on the cross as contradictory to this point. Although Jesus cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was not saying that there was more than one God. Christ was fulfilling the prophecy of Psalm 22. He certainly was not proclaiming a plurality of gods by referring to the Father as my God. Another very interesting point came from reading a book by Dr. Sam Jip entitled, For His Pleasure, which points out why we exist on this earth. The King James Bible is very clear when it says that we are and were created for the pleasure of the Creator Jesus Christ. KJB. Revelation 4 verse 11 Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Imagine how simple, how wonderful, life would be if every single person would realize that they owed their very existence to a supernatural creator, not named intelligent design. Imagine if everyone determined to live in such a way as to bring pleasure to this creator. Sam Jip wrote, We are here to put a smile on God's face. Every thought, every action, every deed should bring pleasure to the Lord Jesus Christ. What does the NIV do to this simple truth? Neve. Revelation 4 verse 11 You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. The NIV completely distorts the point altogether. Every effort by those responsible for the modern versions seems to be made to avert one's attention away from Jesus Christ. The attack is most vehement when the verse speaks of Christ as creator, judge, and equal with the Father. Since we were created for his pleasure, Satan must attack and hide this truth through his cronies who are willing to do his bidding for the glory of man, or money. We were created for the pleasure of him that created us. 
How should this influence our behavior? The next chapter more fully addresses one of the most insidious books written on the subject. It unapologetically attacks the King James Bible, though the author claims to be unbiased in his presentation. He concludes that the modern versions are superior to the King James Bible specifically relating to the subject at hand the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. You might question his motives, dollar, if you considered the financial stake he has from his past employer to make such claims. You might suppose him a liar if you consider his latest confession on YouTube concerning the impetus behind creating yet another modern version, dollar. One David Otis Fuller, which Bible? Grand Rapids, Michigan, Grand Rapids International Publications, 1975, page 97. Two American Standard Version, New York, Thomas Nelson and Sons, New York, New York, 1901, page 222. Three White, The King James Only Controversy, Op. Sit, page 139. For New American Standard Version, Glendale, Gospel Light Publications, 1971, page 4, v. 5 James B. Williams, edition, From the Mind of God to the Mind of Man, Greenville, South Carolina, Ambassador Emerald International, 1999, page 93. 6 Ibid, page 96. 7 Ibid, page 98. 8 Samuel C. Jip, For His Pleasure, Miami Town, Ohio, Day Star, 2005.